Man, when I said I wanted Luna to inherit AOA's Queendom legacy, I didn't mean like this. Said I was going to start using that nifty AI voice, but since this could be the last Luna video I ever make, I figured I should just go ahead with my real one. So we're finally here. Luna is done with and over. There's nothing really left to do but examine the circumstances and the reasons we found ourselves here. Unless you're new to Twitter or Tumblr or YouTube or K-pop, you'll probably have seen Luna around lately and heard the basics. That they're toast, mostly due to something about some member named Chu or something. Well, I'm going to give you the blood and gore on that first. Luna are, or were, a 12-member K-pop girl group employed under Blockbury Creative, a subsidiary of Polaris Entertainment, which has ties to some arms dealer company named Ilkwong, and at that point the details stopped mattering. They officially debuted in 2018, but have been a thing since 2016 due to their unique debut process, which we'll get into later. What happened recently involves the member Chu. Basically, she's easily the most popular member of the group, to the point that her activities beyond singing and promoting have extended to her own YouTube show called Chu Can Do It, with over a million subscribers. However, in late 2021, she filed for a suspension of her exclusive contract with Blockberry, and it wasn't difficult to imagine why. Chu's activities were constant, and very likely straining and exhausting her, so most fans understood that she might want to be able to control what activities and promotions she actually does. Since then, Chu has faced a lot of strain from Blockberry, mostly in the form of excluding her from group activities, and finally it's been revealed that they've booted her from Luna, allegedly for abusive language towards staff and abuses of power. Now, obviously, we don't ever truly know idols. Their personalities are intensely manufactured for our consumption, and their whole job is to show a face to the public that sells. However, Blockberry has been facing an absolutely staggering and unprecedented level of backlash from this, not just from fans, but damn near everybody. There's stylists, staffers, show writers, even brands Chu has worked with publicly defending her from these accusations, as well as her former groupmates. Hyunjin made it clear that this news was upsetting to her, and some days later, nine non-Chu members filed an injunction to terminate their contracts. Which, to put it short, means this group is finished. Which is genuinely a shame. Luna, after so many years of hard work, was finally, finally getting somewhere. Luna had clawed their way up and finally had a fighting chance at truly getting recognized as queens of the K-pop world. We had finally broken through, only to see it end this way. I want you guys to understand why this is such a disaster for Luna and Orbitz. Luna's success hasn't been immediate or viral. It's been six years of long, hard work for both the girls and us. We started ridiculously small and unknown, and each new burst of popularity has been a drop in the bucket for the K-pop world, but still very meaningful for Luna. When you think about it, Luna entered said K-pop world at exactly the right time. Since 2016 when they started rolling out solos, the feedback loop surrounding the big four has gotten bigger, and the grip they've got on the industry has gotten tighter and tighter. There's more groups debuting each year than ever, but the competitive aspect of the industry that makes K-pop so unique is disappearing, because you can't break through anymore. It's no longer a competition. These groups are debuting often less with any actual promise behind their hard work, and more hoping that at some point during their slave contracts, they'll be the lucky ones who land a viral popularity boom. Whereas anyone from SM, YG, JYP, or HYBE is pretty much guaranteed hundreds of millions of dollars in views right out of the gate. So entering the industry at the right time as they did was a stroke of good fortune. Luna began around the era of the third generation, but would not be complete until the fourth. I've seen people criticize their debut structure, saying they should have done something similar to NCT, but that's not how it works. NCT's structure only works because they're an SM group. Anyone else that tried it would be unlikely to succeed with it. The growth and increasing power of Luna from Heejin to Olivia Hay is proof that the debut process they went for actually works as a model. Though Orbits were a fandom that was slow to grow, they had a rock-solid attachment to the group that allowed them to weather long hiatuses and misfortune where another group's fandom would have cracked. Said debut process was the idea of Jaden Jong, who has a very sour reputation among Orbits for basically being kind of a dick. There's a bit of a stubborn element among Luna critics, including some of their casual listeners, insisting that Jaden should come back so Luna's music can be quote-unquote good again. This is a fast way to out yourself as not really knowing anything about that situation, because A, Luna's music has always been good from start to finish, and B, Jaden Chong did not really have that much to do with the music. Almost everything these people are talking about is the work of Monotree, who we'll talk about later. But the fact remains that Jaden did manage to create two super crucial things for Luna, the first major elements that attracted fans, those being the debut process and the storyline. 
See, Luna inverted the typical approach to debut in K-pop, starting with solos and combining to form subunits, and eventually the whole group. This effectively treated Luna's slim chances at hitting it big amongst heavy competition for a slowly expanding credit within the industry, as they drew interest due to the wonder of who would be the next girl and what her song and concert would be like, with each one also promoted as having true soloist potential, merit that they earned by going through a competitive trainee selection called Lunation. Sure, there weren't a lot of fans going hard for Luna when it was just Heejin, although quite a lot of orbits like to lie and say they've been around that long. But by the time of Olivia Hay, Luna was a thing, yo. Something consistently chattered about on the edges of K-pop and slowly gaining traction. The other major part of the draw was the storyline. While Luna aren't the first group to experiment with the story that runs through all of their music videos, and far from the only ones by now, they are the ones who did it in the most interesting way, forming a three-part universe with immense potential for theorizing due to DigiPetty's vague and often symbolic art style. The Lunaverse added an extra hype element, because fans could interact with it and form long-running theories, and strongly anticipate the next comeback for what it would add and how it would change things up. This not only assisted Luna in gathering and retaining a fanbase over a long period of time, but also added to their view counts and view links, and pushed them further onto the social media timeline. The first proof that this unusual sort of debut process worked was the debut itself. While attached to a concept many orbits weren't fond of, Hi Hi shot past the realm of early K-pop group infancy and into the tens of billions of views, and gained respectable numbers in the sales department. Chu, already known for her vocals, gained more attention for her now mimetic high note in that song. But the second and more important proof of the strength of Luna's fandom was Butterfly and the immediate aftermath. Butterfly has a rather inflated but not undeserved reputation among orbits, and tends to overshadow more recent comebacks, and I attribute this largely to how much time it spent in the fanbase's memory due to how long without a comeback we had to wait. See, Butterfly was not just a good song and a good music video. It was definitely in the upper tiers of Monotree's work, and it was combined with a very dreamy music video that showcased an appreciation for women, across all ethnicities, weights, religions, conditions, and sexualities. It was something much more sincere than Blockberry's recent half-assed version with Illuminous, and came out at exactly the right time, when social disparities and equality were becoming more powerful topics than before. It also didn't have anything to do with the Luniverse, which is rumored to have been the breaking point between Jaden Jong and Blockberry Creative, the latter choosing to cut his artistic vision from the budget and resulting in him leaving. But while this wasn't quite missed given how orbits were going wild anyway, Jaden wasn't the only thing missing from Luna post-Butterfly. A music show win, their funds, and even a trickling part of their fanbase were failing to put in appearances. Aside from Mnet's blatant attempt to rig Luna away from said music show win, there's also the business with Kakao M, the distributor for Luna's music at that time. Since copies of the XX album were far underprinted and essentially gone once they sold out, the group's sales numbers tanked, and I really think we need to re-examine the situation now that we know more about Blockberry, but that's for later. The point is, Luna and Orbits were plunged into an uncertain future, going an entire year without a comeback, and, despite consistent and growing appreciation due to furiously promoting fans, it would cost them. Disbandment rumors would fly, Blackberry reportedly being in a lawsuit struggle and claiming to be in debt, and the fanbase would unfortunately begin to fracture at the edges and bleed away. There's no real big reason for that last one, because that's just what happens to K-pop groups if they go too long without promoting. But thanks to how much glue was applied to that fanbase over the debut process, Luna did survive where another group might have fallen into obscurity. So without Jaden and Monotree nowhere in sight, what is Blackberry to do? Well, nothing really. Luna's next success would be on the girls themselves. They were putting out dance covers of boy group songs, since their next comeback was designed with a Girl Crush flavor in mind. These covers, really only meant as treats for fans, would eventually get Luna some much deserved spotlight. Their cover of Cherry Bomb by NCT would go viral for how excellently it was performed, gaining a lot of attention for Olivia Hay in particular, and some of that attention would be from Lee Sumon herself. It was exactly what Luna needed to stay on their feet during their first big hurdle, and their skill and talent would be ingrained in the public memory for sure, because Sumon would invest in their comeback and produce for their album first time he'd ever do so for a non-SM group. And if you're in orbit, you've gotten used to this. There's more than I could ever document in this video alone, but believe me when I say that Luna stand out for a reason. Groups like Idol, Eyes One, Itzy, Twice, and whatever Hive group is currently being exploited might get all the music video views and win all the awards. But Luna stay breaking records and earning achievements unique to themselves, things that set them apart from the crowd. This is just one example. So Lee Sumon would be involved in the next two comebacks. So What continues the girl power theme of Butterfly, but with an aggressive, in-your-face direction via the Girl Crush concept. This gets mixed responses. Fans who have settled into the Butterfly mold, as well as newcomers who find this sound too familiar to groups like Blackpink or Itzy who do nothing but that sound, both take issue with Luna's music suddenly being bad, according to them. But while it may be Luna as told by Suman, it is still Luna, whatever naysayers may sneer. They came back and clawed their way to something many fans have felt has been overdue, a music show win. Fans still have a lot of reason to be afraid, though. Dark clouds are still on the horizon, and member Hostel is on hiatus for anxiety. The music video itself fails to set a new view record, 
and only the one win goes to Luna before that thing called coronavirus happens and a global pandemic sets in. Blackberry are still allegedly in debt and still have angry suits snipping at their heels. The fear that it might be another year before they can return sets in very quickly once the glow fades. But it seems that Sumon's involvement has done the trick. Annoying itsy fans who wouldn't know an original concept if it hit them in the face quickly fade into the background, and Eve, Chu, and Olivia Hay are continuing to get more and more attention, as well as Kim Lip and Jin Sol, the latter of whom we get to sing a K-drama OST, fresh off the recognition of her own legendary high note. And Luna's Girl Crush concept, though some call it unoriginal or overdone, does push them into the mainstream and get their name to more fans, and their fandom quickly starts to recover its lost numbers. Fears of a stillborn comeback are soothed after a rather tense eight months, with Sumon again producing for Why Not and its associated b-sides. This one finally gets Luna a good kick in the pants, and although they don't get a music show win, they do see a resurgence in their relevancy in the K-pop market. The improved sales numbers start things off well, but what really does it is Star, the English version of their b-side voice. Their voice performances were already prolific and appreciated, but once Star was given its own music video, things really took off, with the song getting a huge amount of radio attention across the world, up to being played on radio stations in popular American channels, and even in supermarkets. Another eight months pass with Luna's fanbase finally starting to rise, especially due to the increasing promotions of Chu, whose variety presence and likability enables her to start her own YouTube channel, Chu Can Do It, a show themed around saving the Earth. This contributes to the growth of the fandom as well, and by the time of PTT, Orbits have survived a lot of hardship, weather a huge storm, and the fandom is growing very quickly, putting Luna in a position to finally hit it big. Even though we have flipped that now, PTT seems like it will probably be the last great Luna song and the one they're ultimately remembered for, since conditions were right for a song as good as that one, with as intense a production and promotion as it had to go big. Everything seems to have gone right. Hostel has returned. Another hit B-side dominates the half of Twitter that PTT doesn't. Luna theorizers are going crazy. The music video is eating tens of millions of views. Chu is skyrocketing in popularity. And despite promotions being cut short with only two performances, it's enough to secure another win. And just as with Why Not, PTT's aftermath is a positive one, a glow with more promotion and recognition. Four members of Luna put out a music video for another Ryan Jun song, while another four members go Medic for their song promoting with a children's mascot. There's a Japanese debut with a banging track, and Luna are finally relevant. The months pass without a comeback, but we get something just as good in the new year, Queendom 2. Luna's hard work and steady rise to Queens of K-pop finally been recognized. Queendom 2 isn't really something that needs remarking on. I could go on at length, but it's the last great achievement from Luna, so much so that they became the only group in the entire Kingdom and Queendom series to get a single charting, with a cover of all things. It's the only thing that really needs to be said when it comes to proving that Luna really did have what it takes to go from nothing to everything. And now we get to ask the question, how has all of this collapsed? What went wrong? You'll have noticed Blockberry's name a few times in that last section. I have yet to mention this, but Blockberry are a company that, in the early days of Luna, held a lot of respect for nurturing a K-pop group with such a strong potential. Respect that has since soured into open spite, as Orbits have slowly come to realize that Blockberry have done very little, if anything, for this group, and have actively hamstrung them several times. I mean, think about all the other names I went through up there. Jaden Jong, Monotri, Lee Su Man, Ryan Jun. All of these were outside factors that helped to create Luna and push them into the K-pop world. Blockberry can't really claim any of it, especially since the one really popular member, Chu, is very noticeably not the member they probably would have preferred to become a variety queen. So now I recap the same series of events, but with a dark underbelly facing the sun this time. The first thing we need to acknowledge is that Blockberry's vision for Luna was probably always at odds with Jaden's. If you watch my prior two videos regarding documenting BBC's bad form, it won't be news to you that Blockberry's interests extend to Heaton, Kimlip, and Eve. Anyone else's popularity, such as that of Olivia Hay or Chu, has been largely accidental and something they'll take advantage of to make themselves money first, and actually better the group a distant second. To be honest, I would be totally unsurprised if Blackberry accepted the Luna project purely as a vehicle to get their preferred trainees into the market. We return first to 2019 with Butterfly. Remember how I said we'd re-examine the Kakao M case? Well, I'm laying my cards on the table. Something was definitely up with that, and it almost certainly links back to Blackberry's shady money habits. It might seem utterly absurd, but I mean, come on. Recent scandals have made it clear that CEOs will grab whatever cash they can, no matter how much worse off it leaves the actual idols. And, of course, this being the year where it was revealed that Blockberry, a supposedly very well-off company, was in legal trouble over debts unpaid, well, yeah. Unfortunately, situations like this aren't as murky and gray as we wish, and when people aren't getting paid, it usually isn't because the money just isn't there. But to really understand Blockberry's slowly sinking reputation over the years, you have to understand their hubris. 2019 was also the last time we saw Monotree, who most definitely didn't have any hang-ups about any damn Lunarous lore shit to justify getting rid of them. I can't prove BBC gave them the boot, 
but I am highly suspicious that they left at the same time as Jaden, unseen near Luna since, immediately following the only Luna title track to truly have a halfway fair line distribution. It's possible they wised up and realized Block Berry didn't have any intention of paying them for their work, which is highly likely. The hints of Block Berry being wage thieves would take a while to fully come to the fore. The lawsuit that was raised in 2019 would pass with a lot of eyebrows raised since the unmet conditions that concurred it should have been relatively easy to fulfill. Block Berry themselves never commented on that matter, and it eventually faded. Reappearances of the money issues would pop up again in 2020, but would be drowned out by the successful comebacks produced by Lee Suman though not enough to die entirely, something often assisted by Luna members clowning the company just lightheartedly enough to prevent them from getting locked in a basement. But in 2021, once the group's choreographer made a public stink about not being paid, and made it very clear that there was no real reason for it that she could see, the glue was probably setting in. As Luna's success grew, so did their fanbase, and as their fanbase grew, so did the scrutiny Blockberry came under. Not being one of the big four, and not endowed with a built-in audience who will eat up whatever they produce regardless of scandals, Blockberry were at that point officially headed down a very steep slope. Luna being mismanaged, improperly marketed, harshly dieted, overbleached, and restricted from social media or even physical freedom has been a consistent problem that, each time, has seemingly gone away. However, these little bite-sized issues that never seem to stick add up over time and steadily chipped away at the company's reputation with fans. The hubris showed through when they finally expelled Chu from the group, so let's get the details on that. Chu filed for an injunction in December-ish of 2021. The water started to get rough when it was rumored that Chu had to carry her own bags and wasn't even given a manager to oversee certain of her activities, tapping into Orbit's already established resentment of Blockberry Creative. Rather than make nice with their dissatisfied artist and smooth fan concerns, though, Blockberry seemingly responded to Chu's successful injunction case by shutting her out of several promotional cycles and limiting a lot of her screen time. Yes, she got to be part of Queendom 2, and recorded for the summer special album afterward. But the world tour that went on was arranged without her, and she wasn't even sent a notice about it, and allegedly, emphasis mine, which resulted in her inability to join due to conflicting schedules. I'm not above thinking that they just outright threw her out of the WhatsApp and disallowed her from joining to her face when asked. But this was not all. They also told of these conflicting schedules when it came to Luna's second Japanese release, which she wouldn't even be recording for, at which point even slow to anger fans were starting to raise their eyebrows, since it was a bit inconceivable that Chu's schedule was so packed that she couldn't even record for her own group's albums, especially when she'd filed for the right to decide her own schedule in the first place. Orbitz began to feel, correctly, that she was being punished for winning a case against Blockberry, or daring to even file one at all. Now, Luna's world tour was not really regarded as a good idea in the first place so soon after a big event like Queendom, which had already denied them a proper recovery period from COVID-19 symptoms, and the tour being sandwiched between comebacks made it even worse. This was immediately proven right, and the tour was an enormous disaster from start to finish, and fans were pissed. Not only was Chu shut out of it, angering her not very small fan pace, but the other 11 girls were run ragged, and their health very noticeably suffered to the extent that more shows were done with missing members than fully stocked. Hasa was performing with her arm in a freaking sling. Q calls to cancel the tour on a rapidly broadening scale, all continually ignored, stoking yet more outrage as it wore on and Blackberry were accused of bleeding the girls dry for any money they could get. The tour would finish in Seoul, only for the Japanese comeback to begin, and here's where that hubris I mentioned kicks in. Luna have had a wide range of releases, and while critics and annoying types here and there have snubbed their noses at the more Girl Crush flavored ones, no Luna release has ever outright flopped, until this Japanese comeback, which was utterly left hanging by orbits. Whatever hype Sick Love might have managed to garner by being an odd eye circle track was completely drowned out by the world tour controversy, and when it finally came out and Heaton was on it, the remaining listeners left in disgust as it ended up being just an attempt to use odd eye circle to piggyback her. And then came Luminous, which can officially be considered Luna's first real trip up. True, Japanese releases don't typically perform to the same extent as the Korean ones, but the crickets were drowning out the vocals at this point. As of December of 2022, two months later, the music video has only just barely cracked 600,000 views. No choreography version has been released, and the song has not been performed or promoted anywhere. And the angle block race seemingly chose to get the heat off of their backs was a total failure, because the whole girl power theme featuring random women dancing to the song was long since past its expiration date, and would have been largely ignored even in the best case scenario. So, with all that said, let's go over what's been happening the past few weeks, what's happening now, and what's probably going to happen in the future. As I already stated, Blockberry finally decided to just give Chu the boot in November. This is basically the epitome of cutting off your nose to spite your face, as Chu is the most popular member, and, while I wouldn't say she carries Luna, they will a lot of the attention they get lately to her. The fans were outraged, and they weren't the only ones. 
Rather than simply let her go and keep clammed up about why, as another company would have done, they decided to defame her, choosing to do so with an accusation of abuses of people and power. Everybody that has ever worked with you has spoken up to call Blockberry on an obvious smear attempt based on a spiteful lie. This includes her groupmate Hyunjin, who seems particularly upset about this and has been vocal on social media about it. It was apparently the final straw for the rest of Luna, too. Shortly after this mess exploded, nine members filed for injunction to suspend their exclusive contracts with Blockberry. This means that the only members of Luna with uncontested contracts are Vivi, who luckily has to sort out work visa issues due to being a foreigner, and Hyunjin herself, who has to fulfill contractual obligations with FIFA before she can file a court case. After being bled for cash by these corporate demons, going six years without being paid for the work, and finally shown that Blockberry will try to destroy their careers if they speak up, it seems that Luna as a whole have decided to rebel. Which is a good thing. I really hope they win their court cases and can escape Blockberry with their careers intact. It's a genuine tragedy this all had to happen to a group that had worked so hard to finally see success. In the best case scenario, the other 11 girls join Chu and her agency, BY4M, and get to continue as 12, which seems of particular importance to at least a few of them. But if they can't, I'll still cheer them on. Sad as it is, I would prefer their health and safety come before them staying together for a project with no life in it. Unfortunately, the story isn't over yet. Blockberry have decided to release a comeback, featuring 11 members of Luna. Not only is this a blatantly transparent move to try and distract angry orbits, but as many have noted, the revenue from the comeback would go straight into BBC's pocket, and in fact would likely go towards legal fees to try and crush the girl's escape attempt in court. So supporting this comeback will actively hurt Luna. Someone once said that the timeline of Luna's ups and downs has proved one thing above all else. Luna don't belong to a faceless company or a single artistic vision. They belong to the fans who love them, and the fans are acting. They're speaking up, this time with open rebellion, including a boycott that's been rather successful so far. I still think we can do more. As fans who support artists and not hateful corporate suits, it's time to act. Let's get this next comeback, if it makes it out of the gate, the biggest fucking failure Blockberry has ever had blow up in their faces. Remember, stand with Luna. Stand for the rights of employees and artists to be paid for their work. Stand against companies that feel free to exploit vulnerable people desperate to achieve a dream. Ignore the comeback so hard that it results in a net loss for Blockberry. Do it for Luna, and do it so that maybe, if we're loud enough, we might could affect some real change in the industry.